I'm joined now by Jim Adler, Vice President of Data Systems and Chief Privacy Officer at INO. Jim, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. You and your team developed a predictive criminal model, is that correct? That's right. What was the purpose behind that exercise? Well, you know, we've been developing a lot of uh, analytic models around how we all fit together in this wired, wired world and things like, will I fit well within a neighborhood mm. uh, for a house I bought? Or will I be successful in this company, for example? Mm -hmm. But this exercise was really to uh, ask the big questions of big data, like what's appropriate and what's inappropriate uh, in, a, in a big context uh, of government using uh, big data mm -hmm. for a, 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 sensitive, a sensitive issue, a sensitive classification problem. And so we thought this would help drive some of the debate. Uh, it's often uh, that these disparate groups of people, like uh, the geeks and the suits and the wonks, don't all get together mm -hmm. and really chew over these tough problems. And I f we really felt like this would be a great yeah. uh, opportunity to sort of drive this conversation. Yeah, what were some of the main major flaws that you saw with the model? Well, <clears throat> on something like this, uh, picking the operating point, it was really difficult because mm -hmm. uh, you got this classic false negative, false positive trade-off. Uh, if there's too many false positives, uh, everybody is classified as a felon. If you if you set the uh, the operating point too much toward false negatives, no one is right. is classified as a felon. And the, and when it's when the stakes are so high, any point is 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 tough. Uh, so I actually discussed that in my strata talk about what what is an appropriate operating point. Uh, you don't really want to do harm when a classifier has to make a binary decision, mm -hmm. and on, on a and a classification problem like this, it's tough to pick one. Right. You have to have you sort of have this anarchy tyranny trade-off, <laughs> and it's and it's just it's tough it's to pick the right. It's quite a spectrum you're working <laughs> on. Right, yeah, it's tough yeah. to pick the right spot. Now, are we at a point where there's enough data to start actually predicting crime? This is a borderline minority report question. I yeah, realize yeah, that yeah, but I, we're getting I, into precogs and all that. True, but true. It, I mean, is it is there enough to start picking things out? Well. It, First of all, you, there's already geographic profiling going on right now. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, companies that are uh, targeting hotspots uh, in, in areas, uh, 500 by 500 foot swaths of ground that have high crime, higher crime. That's really uh, small, though. It is small, which is which is actually nice because what you're you're not classifying an entire neighborhood sure. as high crime area, which has been controversial in the courts over the years. So this is a very small hmm. tag, uh, which is interesting uh, and and actually skirts some Fourth Amendment kind of issues. Um, on the criminal profiling, I mean, there are criminal profilers out there, and there are informants that. Uh, uh, provide information to these criminal profilers and these classifiers are not unlike a computerized informant and of course they don't operate in a vacuum mm. uh, no information when the stakes are this high ever lives in a vacuum and so you have to look at other data other corroborating data uh, uh, the timeliness of, of the other data uh, the reliability of the classifier itself we we struggled a lot with the noise in the data uh, were certain uh, offenses, uh, uh, was the information that was tagged in that offense uh, uh, more accurate than other information? Mm -hmm. And what, where, what is the relative noise level? And trying to discern that when you're looking at data that was entered by county officials uh, with disparate uh, uh, scrutiny on the data, there's a lot of noise in there. And when yeah. the relationship uh, is so tenuous, but the stakes are so high, you need to have this, what we call, uh, what they call in, the, in legal uh, parlance, reasonable suspicion. Okay. So you might have the classifier say one thing, but you got to have enough corroborating forces uh, in order to make some sort of Fourth Amendment case stick. How do you start addressing reasonable suspicion? I mean, is that, can that be automated? I'm guessing probably I, not. No, at, at the end of the day, the courts are going to decide what reasonable suspicion right. is. So you can envision that this computerized informant is going to maybe point the police in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And some arrest will maybe made, and there will be a court proceeding. And okay. a judge will figure out how reliable was this computerized informant, what other corroborating evidence there was. Was, was this uh, tip, computerized tip, detailed enough? Mm -hmm. uh, 
These are the, the issues that the courts have yet to grapple with. But I think as technologists, we need to start asking these questions now. Yeah. Uh, how soon until you think the courts are going to start grappling? Oh, with I think uh, Is it sooner coming? than you think. Really? I, I think you will start to see cases moving through the courts within the next few years for sure. Oh, okay. All right. So last question for you. We're, we're used to tech outpacing regulation. Is, sure. is big data following a, a similar trajectory where it's just way ahead of the regulatory parts? It, it, it is, and I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, outside of general principles of honesty and fairness, which are encoded in our, in our regula regulatory framework, uh, if regulation gets out, out in front of technology too much, uh, you're going to say no to things that you don't even know what they are yet. Right. And so I'm a, I've been a big proponent of self-regulation and responsible innovation and getting some of these questions out into the community sooner than later so companies that are innovating can have their ear to the ground, listen to their toughest critics, incorporate that into, into the product and move forward. A quick story, one of our uh, toughest critics has, has, has been the domestic violence community. And they always asked, hey, could we... Uh, opt out our typically women out of our out of your data and we said absolutely it turns out they gave us a great product feature what they really wanted was uh, women typically women to be able to just remove their last contact out of their the public record not mm -hmm. the entire profile because yeah. they don't want to be they don't want to be erased but they want the trail to run cold interesting uh, because huh. if offenders are moving toward them yeah. they want the trail to run cold but they don't want to be completely erased something we never would have thought of. Right. But by listening to our tough critics, we actually got a great product feature out of it. There's a, a service that we uh, provide called TrueRep where you can actually have fine-grained privacy controls on your information. And that didn't come from us. Yeah. That came from listening to, to people who disagreed with us. So I think that's a, a key uh, revelation around how self-regulation and responsible innovation sure. work. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, Appreciate thanks, you taking man. the time. Appreciate it. You bet.